So the war is going to last for a few more months, but as a practical matter, it's over. So I did a video a few days ago, two or three days ago, I think, about what will happen in Europe after the end of the war. Hmm? Well, now let, let's turn to Russia, because I think that how things turn out for Russia is going to be exceedingly complicated, quite frankly, because at this time, I'm recording this, what day is today? Uh, June 8th. At this time, it's very clear that there isn't going to be any kind of negotiated peace. There is going to be uh, unconditional surrender of Ukraine. Now, why is this the case? Well, because the Zelensky regime, Zelensky himself, has uh, basically his, his hands are tied. Because if he goes for a negotiation, a realistic negotiation, whereby he accedes to the fact that Crimea is gone, the Donbass is gone, Kherson is gone, and probably Zaporozhye and Odessa are or will be gone, you know, the, his own people, the extreme right in his government, will depose him. And so he can't accede to that sort of negotiation. He has to start from the premise that we will only negotiate if Russia removes itself from the entirety of Ukraine, including Crimea. And that, of course, is never going to happen. And so there isn't going to be any kind of negotiation. It could very well be that for tactical and PR reasons, both Russia and the Zelensky regime sit down to talk, but those talks are going to be absolutely meaningless. And also, the mood in Russia is such that Putin doesn't have a lot of room to maneuver anymore in terms of any kind of a ceasefire. Because the people in Russia... The, the upper echelon, the leadership echelon, as well as the middle classes, and especially the intelligentsia, they realize, finally, that this is a war with the United States, not with Ukraine. It's a war over Ukraine, but not with Ukraine. It's with the United States and NATO. And so they realize that, and so they realize that there can only be complete victory in Ukraine. The vic Ukraine, in and of itself, actually doesn't even matter because it's the war with the Americans. That's the war that really matters. And the intellectual classes, the upper middle classes, the leadership classes in Russia understand this. And so they realize that the Russian armies are going to have to go all the way insofar as Ukraine. And so if Putin were to say, oh, yes, let's do a ceasefire, he'd probably be deposed. And he probably doesn't even want to do it because he realizes that, you see, any part of Ukraine that remains free, for lack of a better word, will be a thorn in the side of Russia. No, not a thorn in the side of Russia. It'll be a spear in the side of Russia. Russia can't afford to have a truly sovereign Ukraine on its borders anymore. Ukraine's sovereignty is gone forever. Ukraine, whatever remains, whatever political entity remains that is called Ukraine, will of necessity have to be a puppet state controlled by Russia. That is the only outcome for Russia. Because, you see, the, the east and south of Ukraine at this time, it's quite obvious, Russia is going into those areas, going into the east, going into the south, all the way to Odessa, and they already have Crimea, and all of this band, all the way to Transnistria, this is going to become part of the Russian Federation. And it, it, this is obvious, and it's been obvious since the beginning of April, when the Russian um, administrative military authority in Kherson stated that soon enough the ruble was going to be implemented in the city of Kherson. Oh, why do you do that? Because you're going to take it over. You're going to capture it and bring it into the fold of your country. That whole territory, East Ukraine and South Ukraine, all the way to Odessa, all the way to Transnistria, and I include Kharkov and perhaps Sumy, but that remains to be seen. Sumy... And Dnipro, Dnipropetrovsk, those are the only things that are like maybe yes, maybe no. But Kharkov and Odessa, definitely. All of that band will be a part of the Russian Federation. But that will leave this rump Ukraine state, which will be roughly between a third and half the size of what it is today. Now, I've stated before that I think that the Russians, if they're clever, they make life a living nightmare for the Poles and give them Western Ukraine. But let's set that aside for the time being, and let's just examine this rump Ukrainian state. Why can't the Russians leave it alone? Well, because it borders Russia and it borders Belarus, 
And it's become obvious, because they've stated it, that NATO wants to destroy Russia and will use any means necessary. They try to destroy the Russian economy. They have been arming Ukraine currently with everything that they can get their hands on. The only thing that they have been too afraid to do, because they know they'd lose against them, is put troops on the ground to fight Russian soldiers. That's the one thing that they haven't done, and they're not going to do it, because I think they've come to the conclusion that they can't beat the Russian army. The Russian army is simply too good. But the thing is, see, it remains that you're going to have this rump Ukraine state. If the East and the South go to Russia and become part of the Russian Federation, as I fully expect they will, then you're going to have this rump Ukraine state. Now, why doesn't Russia take it over and absorb it as well? You would well argue. It's a very fair point. Well, two reasons. Number one, it's going to be very poor and it's going to be a money sink. So nobody's going to really want it. Because you see, the east and the south of Ukraine, well, this is all where all the rich lands are, where all the rich farmlands are, the industrial base, and also off the coast of the south of uh, Ukraine, in the Black Sea, is all those uh, natural gas deposits. And so it's a very rich area. In terms of GDP, I saw the figures one time, I think, don't, don't quite quote me on this, but these pieces, I do believe they account for roughly 70% of um, Ukraine's pre-war GDP, excluding Crimea. So it was a very wealthy area, a very economically important area. But that, that rump Ukraine, that, that, that administrative center focused on Kiev and over to Lviv, that rump, that doesn't amount to much in terms of income in terms of, you know, productive, economically productive area. Hmm? The other thing, too, is that, see, it's full of ethnic Ukrainians who speak the Ukrainian language and who call Russians orcs on the daily. And so why would Russia want to integrate into the Russian Federation a piece of land that hates them and that is poor and is going to be a money suck? They don't want to. They won't want to. So they will want to make this rump Ukraine a separate political entity, but not merely neutral, but permanently neutral, absolutely neutral. See, a neutral Ukraine, quote unquote, a, a, a Ukraine, a rump Ukraine that is neutral, but truly politically independent, truly sovereign would inevitably fall under the sway of NATO and the European Union. And that is something that Russia cannot afford and will not allow. It simply can't. And so they are going to install some sort of puppet regime, probably a military dictatorship. I would not be surprised if at this time or soon enough, once the complete disaster of the Donbass becomes revealed and is readily apparent to all, that the Russians will be or have been in talks with the Ukrainian military and creating the conditions whereby the military can overthrow the Zelensky regime, send them packing to the West or wherever they want to go, and take over the rump Ukraine. That's the only like, clear solution. Petro Poroshenko, the previous president, he's a finger puppet of Washington. He's just more of the same. Hmm? And Yanukovych, who currently lives in Moscow, well, see, he's Russian. He's ethnically Russian. And he appealed to the east and the south of Ukraine. That's what got him elected. But if the east and south are now stripped from Ukraine and they are part of the Russian Federation, and we have this Ukrainian rump state then Yanukovych has no power there, has no popularity, has no base. In fact, he'd be considered, you know, another orc, an invader. Mm -hmm. And so Yanukovych, who's in Moscow now, I don't quite know what he's doing there, but he's not going to play any role in any kind of future government of the rump Ukrainian state. The rump Ukrainian state, what, it seems obvious at this time, is that it would be a military dictatorship closely allied, quote unquote, to Moscow, really under the thumb and the control of Moscow. 
and they would have to reorganize the state and try to get it back up on its feet. But Russia will never allow it to actually be a successful country. It can't allow it to become a successful country. The rump Ukraine state that remains after this war is over will have to be permanently weak. And the fact is, see, so many people and so many of the best people of Ukraine have left it already that this rump Ukraine state will never recover. Because you have to remember always, see, it's not the land, it's the people. If the people leave, especially the best people, the most educated, the young, the hard workers, if they have left for richer prospects in the West, in Europe somewhere, in Switzerland or France or Germany or Poland or wherever, they're not coming back. Oh, yes, of course. I mean, a few here and there will. Anecdotally, a few will, sure. But the vast majority will never return. And how many people have left Ukraine at this time? It's conservatively estimated that altogether it's maybe 6 million. 1 million who have fled to Russia and another 5 million or so who have fled to the West. Now, of those who have fled to the West, how many realistically will return once things normalize, say, within the next uh, 6 to 12 months? Hmm? 20% at best, because all these people who fled as refugees, they landed in the lap of luxury compared to Ukraine. They're not going to want to go back to a broken nation that's under the thumb of Russian occupation and Russian political control. They're going to stay in Switzerland or Denmark or wherever the hell they are. They're going to stay there forever. By the time they have the opportunity to return, many of them will have found some nice girl or some nice guy and they're going to have a nice job and nice income and they're not going to want to come back. And so this rump Ukraine state will be hollowed out demographically. It will be a, a, a tragic sight. I mean, nobody with a heart can look at it as anything other than a complete disaster for Ukraine. But that's what's going to happen to the rump Ukraine. But let's look at the Russian picture overall. They've got the east of Ukraine and they've got the, um, the, southern, uh, the northern coast of the Black Sea all to themselves, all the way to Transnistria. So there, they're sitting pretty. They've got a military dictatorship or some other governing authority in Kiev under their thumb doing what they want. And so things are going okay in Ukraine. But what's NATO's next move? Well... We've gotten a bit of a preview with this notion of integrating Sweden and Finland into NATO, which is the dumbest idea ever. And whoever is running things in Finland and Sweden, I mean, uh, Finns, Swedes, uh, get rid of them and hire people with some brains. huh? And NATO is now talking about any nation has the right to have nuclear weapons in their border, which is just provoking the Russians for no reason whatsoever. It's just stupid. And as a practical matter, even if Finland and Sweden were to become a part of NATO, which is not self-evident at this time, even though they want to, but the Turks are saying, mm -mm -mm. but even if that comes to pass, do you honestly think that the Russians would for a second allow nuclear weapons in Sweden, in Finland, in the Baltic republics, or even in Poland? Do you honestly believe that? Because there's something else that has to be very, very clear. You see, uh, uh, when you break the glass and, and, and pull the emergency handle, right? The hard part is to break the glass the first time. That's the hard part. When you go to war, like a big war, like here over Ukraine, that's a big deal. But when you break the glass and pull the lever... Well, the time after that is going to be a lot easier now, isn't it? Yeah, because you got used to it and you're like, oh, okay, I know more or less what to expect now. I mean, I did it once before, so I can do it again. And I'll know more or less what will happen. Finland, Sweden, Poland, the Baltic states, any of them are dumb enough to accede to hosting nuclear weapons. The Russians are not going to hesitate, not for a second. They're going to roll over it roll over those countries instantly. They will turn the Gulf of Finland into a Russian lake. No question. And the thing is, see, do you know why NATO has not put soldiers on the ground in Ukraine? Because they know they'll lose. It's as simple as that. The American army, with their very sophisticated weapons and all the so many men that it has, 
they know that they would lose against the Russians, and they're scared of that. The Pentagon knows that they would lose, and lose badly. That's the hard truth of it. You know, you keep hearing these stories of these uh, veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, and they come up to uh, Ukraine and they get a dose of Russian artillery and they go home shell-shocked, tail between their legs, and they're like, oh man, man, it's, it's heavy out there. Yeah, yeah, that's what it's like, like real war. Not the pretend war with goat herders that you had out in Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever the hell. This is the real thing. And the thing is also, too, something that a lot of people have been pointing out. I've been pointing out for quite a while, and people are catching up. See, American weapons are incredibly fragile. The whole point of American weapons is not to have effective weapons. It's to make a lot of money for the weapons manufacturers. And so they have created weapons that are extraordinarily sophisticated, extraordinarily expensive, which means huge margins. But they are extraordinarily delicate. They can't make it in a real war. And the Pentagon probably realizes this. And so the State Department in the United States might go the Finns, the Swedes, to join NATO, and they might have this incredibly irresponsible talk of having nuclear weapons in any sovereign state that wants them. The Russians are going to roll over them, just take them over. They've got the men. They've got the weapons, they've got the battle-hardened leadership and command and control. They've got what it takes, man, because they've shown it, because they're winning here. And so what does NATO do? I mean, like I said before, the Turks are putting up all kinds of roadblocks about uh, you know, Finland and Sweden, Sweden joining NATO. But let's assume for the sake of argument that they do. What then? What is NATO going to be doing? They're going to be constantly trying to provoke the Russians. Now, that, that's going to be their game plan. Just constantly provoke. And it's going to be like a needling, like e -e -e -e, all day long. Mm -hmm. And so Russia is going to have to figure out a way how to distract the NATO alliance. Because, you see, Russia is going to realize that, see, if they engage, then it's like a whole shit show. And anything can happen, Okay. If they engage also, it's going to be exceedingly dangerous for the Russians for a very simple reason. And I think a lot of the Russian leadership is probably catching on to this. And it's something that you should catch on to. You see, what's going on with the United States is that the United States is a collapsing empire. It is collapsing. All of this that's going on now, all of this uh, flailing around, not just in Europe, but also in, in, in the Pacific. There's all kinds of stuff that's going on in the Pacific. That'll be for a different video. But all this flailing around by the Americans, they realize that they are a collapsing empire. And you see, when you have an empire that's collapsing, all kinds of terrible things that can happen. In their efforts to shore up their position and go, get back to the good old days, they wind up starting wars that they might lose. Now in the past, this wouldn't have been such a big deal, but today we have nuclear weapons. And the current leadership in Washington, at all levels, is proving itself unbelievably irresponsible. They are the ones who have been uh, bringing up the topic of a nuclear war. They're the ones who have been just toying with the idea as if it's something that could actually be uh, carried out successfully. In a nuclear war, everybody loses. They, it's inevitable. Smarter men than you and me have figured this out, man. And they figured it out decades ago. There's no discussion on this issue. It was the centerpiece of the whole piece from 1945 until 1991. Mutually assured destruction. Uh, it was okay. Kennan wrote his piece in 46, I think, or 47, but you get the picture. This is the conclusion that smarter men than any of us alive today came to three quarters of a century ago. And now the leadership in Washington is toying with the idea of nuclear war. 
because they want to shore up American power. They want to have this global empire. They don't understand that American global hegemony was an accident. It happened accidentally in 45 and accidentally again in 91. But it was because all the, the other people around who could compete had sort of like collapsed or were the victims of war. And it, it was a different world in 45 and 91. But they want to return to those good old days. And so they're lashing out. And so what Russia has to be doing is not provoking the, Russia, the Americans, rather. The Russians have to be going out of their way to make sure that this thrashing, panicked, fearful empire that is collapsing focuses its attention elsewhere. China. Because this collapsing empire sees its closest rival as the, as the imminent threat. I mean, don't get me wrong. The leadership in America hates the Russians, hates them with a passion. I mean, Jesus Christ, do they hate the Russians. And they project this hatred to all their little European goblins who follow along. And it's been shocking for the Russians. It's certainly been shocking to me. I think it's been shocking to anybody with a little bit of decency, the amount of hatred and vitriol that has flown out of the Americans. But that's... Uh, that, that's not really important to this point. The, the point here is that, see, the Americans hate the Russians with a passion, but they're scared of the Chinese. They're really scared of the Chinese because they know that economically China is bigger than America. And it bothers them. It, 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 just, it just itches at them. And so they are projecting onto China what they themselves are, and they are fighting or want to fight China because really what they're doing is projecting who they are onto China, which has become like a mirror. It's, it's a weird psychological thing that's going on, but pay attention. And you'll notice that just about every statement made by Washington about China, about China's purposes and, and its motivations and its intentions, you're, you're like, that's not really China's intent. It's more like the American's intent. Like how the Chinese are making friends with the Solomon Islands, how they're making friends with Cambodia. Cambodia is their next door neighbor, for crying out loud. It's, it's like the United States making friends with, I don't know, Guatemala or something. They're right there, right? And of course, China is going to try to make good relations with Cambodia or with the Solomon Islands, which is, again, right there. And the Americans are saying, no, what they're trying to do is establish global hegemony so they can attack and you realize that it's a weird projection that's going on. Look it up. It's, it's really bizarre, but that's what's going on. So anyway, the point is that the Russians, what they have to do is they have to somehow distract the Americans, get them to sort of like ignore Europe and Russia, give up the ghost. I said, and I don't know if it was a video or a tweet thread, it doesn't really matter. I've said that what the Russians have to do is to bore the Americans. Just keep on relentlessly grinding, just bore them. Just do something just like every day, just a little bit, just a little bit, boring, slow and boring. And the Americans will lose interest, especially if it's a losing cause, a losing cause to the American cause. The Russians are gonna have to somehow, somehow like find like a tennis ball and, and throw it and get the Americans to chase it. I don't know what specifically that tennis ball could be, but they have to find something because, you see, the Europeans, they are not that stupid. They're probably going to come around and realize that they need to make friends with Russia somehow and they need to peel away from the Americans. The more I think about it, the more that's pretty obvious, especially when we come up to this terrible winter that Europe is going to suffer. They're going to realize how badly they need um, uh, Russia. And so everybody's going to try to figure out how to get how to distract this collapsing empire to focus elsewhere. And so Russia is going to have to do that. Somehow figure out what's a good tennis ball to chuck far away so that the Americans go running after that tennis ball and ignore them. Mm. You see, in the last century, there have been two empires that have vanished. Great empires that vanished. The British Empire and the Soviet Empire. And we, in general, in the world, we're... We were exceedingly lucky 
Because in both cases, that destruction, that elimination, annihilation of these two empires happened bloodlessly, or relatively bloodlessly. But that's rare in history. In 1956, the British Empire, for all intents and purposes, ceased to exist after the Suez Crisis. In 1991, Christmas Day, the Soviet Union ceased to exist. But those were peaceful, orderly collapses of great empires. We're not going to be so lucky with the collapse of the American Empire. The American Empire is collapsing from within. And at the same time, it is thrashing around in foreign policy. And so within and without, it's just thrashing arms as it circles the drain. That's what's happening with America, with the American empire. Now, once you realize that that is what's happening, once you have that mental model that within it's collapsing and fighting itself and just tearing itself apart, and outside it's thrashing randomly to, to, to somehow come back and get back on top, then when you have that model firmly in your mind, everything becomes very, very clear. And you start to realize how truly dangerous this moment is. The United States is the great danger to the entire world. Its collapse, which we are witnessing, is the true danger that we have to deal with. It's what Russia is going to have to deal with, and China as well, for that matter. The whole world is going to have to deal with this. And how the world deals with this collapsing empire will determine our collective future. It will determine whether or not we have a future. Because remember, this is the first collapsing empire that's thrashing in its death throes and has the ability to destroy the world. Understand what's going on. 